Hello, I'm Rob Forsyth. Welcome to Liberalism in Question. In this half-hour podcast from the Centre for Independent Studies, we explore questions and challenges to liberalism today. My guest today is a man who works here with me at the Centre for Independent Studies. He's the author of a number of books, including The Tyranny of Tolerance and Sacred and Profane, and was co-edited with me for the book on religious freedom called Forgotten Freedom No More. And yet he doesn't identify as a liberal. Peter Curti is the director of the Culture, Prosperity and Civil Society program. He's also an Anglican priest who served both here in Australia and in the United Kingdom. Welcome, Peter. Thanks, Rob. Very good to be with you. Before I ask you why you're not one, what what do you take liberalism to be? I think both liberalism and conservatism have become very elastic terms and they mean all kinds of things to different people. I think of liberalism as a political position and orientation that is concerned with, I think, reform. It seeks to change, it seeks the betterment of society, and its focus is usually on the individual. Whereas conservatism is is not opposed to reform, but doesn't see uh, its position as being about, uh, about reform, but about securing uh, stability and ensuring that existing uh, institutions and norms are able to prevail, and for me, most critically, uh, places a much greater emphasis on the place of the individual in community. So I think there is a, a, a communal identity and a communal bond that is that is important to conservatism that I think liberals often play down. So you're a conservative. Is, I take it from your comments, you identify as conservative rather I do. than liberal. Yes, I do. Have you always felt that way? I think so. It took a number of years for though for that to become clear. But yes, I think from as a teenager, uh, before I was able to, to vote in the United Kingdom, I had uh, um, conservative instincts, but wasn't <laughs> wasn't able to articulate them. But I voted consistently. Um, so no teenage rebellion for you, Peter Curdy. Well, the rebellion was that my family was uh, in, in the UK was a Labour voting family. Oh, I see. So the rebellion came in the fact that in 1979, when I voted for the first time, I voted for Margaret Thatcher. So we have with us uh, uh, the young fogey Peter Curdy <laughs> to speak on <laughs> conservatives. <laughs> More seriously, you, you think there are some weaknesses in liberalism that you tried to identify. What could you unpack that a little further? What do you think are are, are the, the weak spots in in a liberal worldview and a, a liberal political philosophy? I think liberalism, in the broadest sense, seeks uh, to bring about change. It always seeks to bring about change, uh, and it tends to set itself up uh, in opposition to conservatism as that which uh, seeks to overcome what it perceives to be the resistance that, uh, that conservatism uh, represents. I, I don't think conservatism is an ideological position. I don't think it's uh, it, it doesn't. It can't be described in terms of a body of doctrine. It is a. It's an orientation. I think for liberalism, for lib people who identify as liberals, particularly as classical liberals, they see change as being um, and reform as being paramount. As a conservative, I don't see that as being paramount. That's not to say that I'm opposed to reform, but I don't think reform is the is the starting point. Wouldn't it be more accurate to say the liberal point of view thinks that human liberty? And the individual flourishing is the heart of a political and social philosophy, rather well, th- rather than just reform. I mean, well, I think conservatives pursue human flourishing, and they but they do so not just in terms of the status of the individual, but in terms of the the well being and the coherence of society. So I think social cohesion is very important to to conservatives, even when it stands in the way of. Proper reforms of better, of, of better human rights, of better human freedoms. Uh, it c- could not society, as you, you understand it, be a, a, a stultifying effect. On well, human. I mean, it's not 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 not. So you're saying society in itself is a good thing. But if I may say so, you're making the very mistake that I think liberals uh, generally make, which is to view conservatism as um, as I- invariably opposed to any kind of change. Now, where reform is needed where the freedom of the individual needs to be protected and upheld, conservatives should see the need to act and do see the need to act. But 
their, their instincts for reform are tempered by a desire to ensure that institutions, norms, structures that that provide stability to society and therefore stability to the life of the individual uh, should pre- should be preserved. Where they're not working, change is needed. Conservatism therefore believes in slow change. Uh, sometimes slow change, sometimes m- more rapid change. If if change needs to be brought about, I mean, you need to remember that that the uh, and we can of course debate whether or not M- Margaret Thatcher's 1979 government was a conservative government, but of course the British Conservative Party. Identifies as as a, as a conservative lowercase C party, and it was one of the great reforming governments of the of the late twentieth century. Yes, that may may suggest that in the United Kingdom, as here in Australia, reading liberalism, conservatism, and, and social democracy, democracy on, the, on those hands, simply off party behaviour, may be somewhat misleading. Actually, I think it is misleading, and I think that the there are elements of liberalism and conservatism woven into certainly into into the the, the fabric of the British Conservative Party and in the the, the Liberal Party in this country. Uh, and I think, but that's why I say that it's an orientation and not an ideology. So your main critique of liberalism, as I understand it, is that it overemphasizes the individual, overemphasizes the freedom for change against the significance of societal stability and harmony, and 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 um, and. Well, when I've got that. It's, yes, it's, that's you're, right. You're trying to say there's something that you, unhelpfully too individualistic about it, from your point. Of I view. think there can often be a, 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 a an undue emphasis on the on the individual, which I don't think. I think that can be unhelpful. I think that can be unhelpful because I think that it's important to place the individual in a wider context. The <clears throat> liberalism can take, a, I think, a very atomistic view of the individual, whereas the individual, in my view, is very much part of, of a larger entity. That is to say, it could be the family, it could be the local community and society in, in, broad, in, in general. Are you kind of a Burkean? Liberal conservative. I, well, <laughs> Burke is claimed by both liberals and conservatives, yes, but to the extent that he's a conservative thinker, yes, I am, um, uh, and not in a party political sense, because of course Burke uh, came, was, was, was working long before yep. uh, there was a, the, 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 the political identification of conservatism. But yes, I'm a Burkean, uh, very sympathetic to Burkean conservatism. As opposed to Thomas Paine and the, the raw radicals of the American Revolution or the French Revolution, uh, Burke was. yes, or even uh, even people like Fox in Britain, who were much more uh, with whom Burke split over the over the French Revolution. I see. Um, seeing it as being something that, uh, and it's interesting, of course, that Burke was opposed to the French Revolution but supportive of the American mm. Revolution because he saw those be those revolutions as being about about different, uh, as, as seeking d- different objectives. Pursuing different objectives, whereas the American Revolution was about uh, justice and about the fair treatment of people in what was then the American colony at the hands of the British Crown. Uh, the French Revolution was simply about overturning, or I mean, this is a caricature, but overturning, just overturning society in the name of displacing uh, everything and putting in a, a, what turned out to be a, a regime of terror. On the way through, yeah. The American Revolution has often caused some interest these days, especially because, although it was as you've characterised it, it was blind, it seemed to be blind anyway, uh, to the existence of enslaved people and that slavery was an intrinsic institution. Does that suggest that liberalism and conservatism have blind spots or had blind spots? Uh, Slavery is, I think, one of the most interesting and vexed Topic certainly in terms of um, British and American political life, because the great proponent proponents of freedom in uh, in the United States, what became the United States, were in some instances slave owners. Um, the The abolition of slavery in Britain was a very long, painful, and protracted process. It took a long time. Uh, yes. I think there was, we would say now, a, 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 tr- a tremendous and terrible uh, blind spot. And, and really, I think s- the, the institution of slavery, which of course prevails to this day in, in many countries in the world, but the institution of slavery uh, flew and does fly 
are fast in the face of the sorts of, of, of views that are propounded about human equality, uh, the importance of liberty, and the, <clears throat> and the importance of, uh, f- uh, of equality of opportunity, not just equal equality of, of, of status. So yes, I think there, there have been some terrible blind spots. And I think that certainly in the United States in particular, that's a, a, a sore that continues to run. Does does your philosophy or your outlook? You you don't want to call conservatism an ideology. Does your outlook have a sense of great sensitivity to issues of power imbalances, a human not not just individual freedoms, but uh, some of the things that we've forgotten in a world in which individual freedom is the main focus. If you're talking about the um, the evolution of of human rights and the importance of defending the individual from uh, uh, the unwarranted encroachment of state power, then yes. And that, I think, is what is where we see the basis of, of the movement for human rights that came to particular fruition in the 20th century. Today, rights have become means of assertion that people assert rights to all kinds of things, including economic and, uh, and, and social benefits. But the notion of, funda- of human rights fundamentally uh, is concerned with protecting the individual from the encroachment of the state. So a conservative response to undue an unwarranted exercise of state power, I think, is to is to emphasize the importance of individual liberty and to see that the individual, the standing of the individual is protected. I'm Rob Forsyth and this is Liberalism in Question and my guest today is Peter Curti from the Centre for Independent Studies. Peter, you've just said that... Uh, you believe human rights and is, are important to protect individuals from the encroachment of the state, from undue encroachment, I think you said. What criteria do you bring to understand what is undue and what is not undue? That's a, that's a, a big and difficult question. And I think that it's hard to, uh, or at least I find it hard to, to, to sketch a, 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 a a, a hard and fast principle, <clears throat> but and I think to, to can you think of examples, perhaps, in, 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 in that you've had to write about or in, in your own your own research? I think the um, one of the rights that's concerned me in particular in recent years has been the the human right to religious freedom, and I mean that's something that we have worked on together as well. But where the individual is not free for whatever reason to exercise in a reasonable way and to manifest in a reasonable way their religious belief because of, um, of, of the overbearing authority of the state, then I think that is an issue. That is an, a very good example of the, the importance uh, of, of defending uh, uh, human rights. And I think also we have to, to note that it's in this country that people have a more conservative a disposition, as well as a classical liberal disposition, but people of a more conservative dis- disposition have been at the forefront of efforts to protect and to uphold that, that right. I, I can see in places like um, many of the Middle Eastern countries, uh, I think in China in practice, if not in theory, there's some real issues be- about religious freedom and the power of the state. Do you think it's an issue in, in Western countries like ours? About the power of the state... Encroaching, encroaching on religion. You use religious freedom as your example. It's an issue, but I don't think it's... uh, It's not as troubling as it is in some of the countries that that, that you've... you've, It it wouldn't want to be, actually. No, no. And and one of the reasons it's not is because we have a free press, we have freedom of speech, we have um, freedom of association, and all the sorts of freedoms that we associate with... Uh, with the, the, the right to religious liberty and with, with religious freedom. I think one of the challenges for a society like ours is not so much holding back <clears throat> the state, but working out how we live with the competing claims uh, and, and, and demands, in some instances, of religious, different religious groups in a multicultural society. And that's where we have to watch out for the power of the state. Because if we are committed to multiculturalism, if we are committed to diversity, we have to afford uh, people from in different faith communities the freedom to order their the lives of, of their families and communities in accordance with those faith traditions. Where the faith, where the, where the state impinges upon that and stops that, we have to test and question. But one of the challenges, and this is something that's arisen, just it arose in the last few weeks of 2020, was the issue, a very contentious issue of 
of, of what's called in Islamic circles female circumcision, but, but we know and the law knows as female genital mutilation. Uh, and this came up in the context of a, of a foster card, and I, I, I've written about uh, written about this. Came up in the in the context of a of an Islamic uh, an Islamic foster guide, and there a guide, were, a guide to p- people fostering children. Correct. Yes, yes. yes, yes, uh, yes. A, a guide for for yes, Muslim okay. families who are Muslim parents who seek to to foster yes, children, yes, and there was a lot of concern because the, this guide did not uh, make clear in its first in its first edition did not make completely and unequivocally uh, unequivocally clear that uh, female genital mutilation is illegal in this country so there is to my mind this this and for example child marriage is a very good example of the way in which you would say yes you are free to pursue to pursue your religious belief you are free to practice your belief and to manifest that belief but you must do so in a, in strict accordance with the laws of the land. Now, where those laws are unreasonable, where they are reasonable, is a matter that is continually tested. In Australia, these sorts of practices that, that I've referred to are illegal, and the, that's the will of the community. And as I understand it, the um, in the human rights instruments that we often look to from the United Nations, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, says that religious freedom is subject to such. Um, I've get the, what's necessary to protect. That's absolutely right. Uh, what public morals and so forth and so on. Yes. In other words, it's not unreal. Can I ask you then on this question of, of uh, take you further? We, I think the question of gen- genital mutilation and child marriage is is, is non contentious in this in this country, even if there may be some cultural hangovers from other places. It's not contentious, but but I think what we what what society needs to see is an unequivocal unequivocal commitment on the part of all oh, yes, understand. members of society to. Accept that norm. They, there must be an unequivocal, unequivocal acceptance of that norm. Where there appears to be a, a, a degree of diffidence or hesitation, I, I, yes, that I understand. Brings, so, well, let, let, let me give you another case. Uh, our society is committed, on, on the whole, I believe, to the equality of the sexes. It's committed to um, no discrimination for sexual preferences and behaviours. And yet, these are issues in which often religious communities find themselves minorities. I, the word I use is recalcitrant minorities, meaning they're not going to go away soon. What do you say there? Where, where should uh, these, this is where you've made most contrast these days, I think, with religion, religious, uh, behave, religious communities and the law of the land. That has been a, a contentious issue in this country in recent years as we've n- navigated the, the issue uh, of, of same-sex marriage, or marriage equality as it's called. To what extent is the Christian church or our Christian church is free to... Um, Not just Christian church, it applies across any religion. No, but the Christian churches have been in the forefront of the of this debate because I think other groups, certainly the, the, the Muslim community has been much quieter on this. So the Christian churches have been in the forefront. To what extent are Christian churches free to, to propound their doctrines uh, drawn from scripture uh, on matters of human sexuality? Uh, that is something that is and still s- being resolved in this and country. And not just propound their doctrines, but select their members, select their leaders, um, behave and in way... The, and the and staff so forth. of their schools yes, and, and, so forth, and, yes. and faith-based institutions. This is surely an issue where where the state and individual freedom are, are really in some tension because there's a the freedom of some to say, I, I've got the, I want the freedom not to be discriminated against on the basis of my sexuality, and other institutions saying, we need the freedom to practice yes. our, um, our deeply held... Religious convictions, would they be true or not? It's not the question here. No, that's right. Uh, I think what what we pursue is, and we are always pursuing, <clears throat> what might be called a reasonable accommodation. Now, what is an accommodation? What is reasonable? Those are in themselves terms that are that are open to debate. But I think it is a we seek a reasonable uh, accommodation, and it, it requires. In an open society like Australia, and I think I have to say I think Australia does this very well. I think that it, the, the, the debate can get a bit fractious, but on the whole, I think our society does handle these issues well because we are committed to diversity, and there are there there are people who protest loudly about uh, about the manifestation of difference. But I think that on the whole, we handle these well. But I think it requires vigilance. I think we always have to be watching. We have to be alert 
to to the, the undue encroachment of the state. We also have to have an understanding of what is and is not acceptable in this country. Now, sometimes I get the sense that, in fact, as the country has embraced same-sex marriage, there is less, there's a, a, there's a diminishing willingness to to tolerate the those Christian churches that are standing against that trend. I don't, we'll have to see whether that's borne out. I think the mood of the country has changed significantly, but I think the fact that we can debate these things uh, and continue to do so, and that we are that we need to debate them, is actually a sign of a healthy society. It, it seems to me that um, all societies have issues which which are not worthy, which they don't tolerate on moral grounds, and those which they, although they think others are wrong, they accept them as reasonable. For example, I don't think anyone today would uh, would tolerate in pre- principle, in practice, it does happen still. I know any explicit racist claims, right? The, the, and, um, That's correct. When the same-sex marriage bill came through the parliament, many people greeted this with those in favour, with the joy, saying this is parallel to the removal of the Jim Crow laws in the United States during the civil rights movement, and that those who oppose to uh, this change were equivalent to those who want um, coloured people at the back of the bus. This was actually said by by a by a common commentator uh, of, of some mainstream commentator am i am i right if that view prevailed it would mean for those who didn't hold the majority view on these matters it'd be very hard to have them being tolerated i think the it was a it was a, a, a it, it might have been rhetorical over, overreach but if, well, it, but if it was seriously held it would, would not mean serious trouble for for freedom for certain groups in our society yes you said that i think the parallel is erroneous it's the, there's no parallel at all um, and I think the issue of human sexuality and human and and uh, and race, which is in itself a disputed characteristic, a, a disputed category, I should say, um, is it, the, the parallel is un- is cannot be drawn. It's they they are not equivalent things at all, um, because the uh, the debate about racial equality went to fundamental characteristics of human being that were unalterable whereas I think and I don't I don't want to get into a debate about genetics but I think there are there there is still very much open a, a debate about whether or not sexual orientation is something that is chosen um, or is something that is governed by uh, governed by by uh, genetic inheritance but I think race and and the freedom Draw, to draw a parallel between uh, racial discrimination and the desire to preserve a particular human institution, that of marriage, to uh, to heterosexual couples, is 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 a comparison that does not work. I, I take uh, you, you. You may well be right. Uh, my point wasn't whether it's a valid comparison. My point was in a society that makes those moral judgments, there is going to be a lot of trouble, and therefore to have the tolerant free society, there needs to be a kind of Compromise and need to respect, um, even if you don't agree, certain viewpoints which, though they're wrong, are regarded as tolerable. Well, I think the the point is that in open society, there has to be an opportunity to to state one's objection to those sorts of claims and to argue that they are wrong and to show why they are wrong. If we don't have that freedom, I think then uh, then all other freedoms are. Which is one of the reasons I think that that I mean to pick on religious freedom is 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 fine, but there is, there is, it's just one of a number of freedoms that go to the heart of human liberty. And, and that's why I've spoken um, a, a, about a quartet of freedoms, that freedom of religion belongs with freedom of speech, freedom of association and freedom of conscience. And that you cannot just remove that and speak about freedom of religion independently of the others. It depends upon freedom to associate, to discuss, to debate and to disagree. Do you think these are under threat? I think they're under strain at times. I don't think they are under threat. I don't think in Australia we can really, when looking at some of the, at some other countries in the world, I don't think we can really say that they are under threat. But I think they are. They get strained, and there can be prevailing views uh, put forth in in the mainstream media that make it difficult to 
uh, advance a, a different point of view. I think we have the freedom to push back against that. And one of the things we do at the Centre for Independent Studies, not, and not just in, in the area in which you and I work, the culture programme, but in other areas as well, one of the things we have the freedom to do is to push back and show why arguments advanced by, uh, by others are at times wrong. This is the Liberalism in Question. I'm Rob Forsyth, and my guest today is Peter Curdy. Uh, in your own work, you have done some pushing back. In, in your books, you're a great pusher-backer. <laughs> Well, I, yes, I think that's what that's what a think tank does, and that's one of the things. And what do you push back? <clears throat> I've pushed back on religious freedom. I've argued uh, a number of years ago when I first started working on religious freedom. I argued that anti discrimination legislation, um, if, if we weren't careful, anti discrimination legislation would impact unreasonably and unfairly on 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 religious points of view, and that we needed to be able to. Uh, we needed to defend religious freedom. We, ne we needed to, uh, to demonstrate that there was a threat. And that's one of the issues which I've pushed back. I've pushed back in the other direction as well, it has to be said. I've argued um, at a time when uh, a number of, uh, of people on the centre-right were arguing against the freedom of women, of, of Muslim women, to wear uh, face covering, the hijab. Um, I argued that they should be free to do that. So I've, I've pushed back against... A, a range of views, sometimes some of which have made me even less popular than others. The last one's an in interesting question. It is, I'm thinking of you as a conservative here. A conservative have a view of, put this way, do you have a view of what should be conserved, a vision of values and in society, or is it more an attitude of we mustn't change things quickly, you must be thoughtful? Is it about process? It is about process, I know. But it's also a vision of a certain view of culture and society that lies beneath that. Yes. Is that clear about what I was asking? Yeah. Yes, I, I am concerned to maintain social cohesion, to preserve social stability, to preserve social harmony, so that people from all kinds of backgrounds can live together in in peace and in harmony. And one of the reasons I think that people should be free to wear um, any kind of religious garb is that that, is, that can go to their identity and that they need to be free to express that identity as long as, and this is the very important proviso, and it's not doesn't just extend to, to women who want to wear the hijab, as long, and I'm assuming that, it, that, these, that this vesture is chosen freely, I think where it's imposed, if there's evidence that any kind of vesture is imposed, that raises other questions. But let's, for the sake of argument, assume that it's freely adopted. They sh that should be the case as long as it's not, as long as it does not become a symbol of alienation from wider society. So you have to be able to demonstrate, I I'm a faithful Christian, Jew, Muslim, and I am loyal to Australia. I'm a, uh, this I'm raised the very good thing. The question I'm going to ask actually was: you've, in, you've endorsed multiculturalism as a reality, and yet is that not, in some sense, in tension with a conservative view of society? Because societies need to have things in common to hold them together. You talk a lot about harmony. You want to explore this a little further with me uh, as we come towards the end of our, our discussion? As a conservative with liberal leanings, I think that's fair. <laughs> your view about coherence of society and difference in society. I think multiculturalism is in itself a very, uh, a very contested idea. <clears throat> and one of the reasons I think working in a think tank is, is so stimulating intellectually is that w one is turning these ideas over uh, continually. But in a, in a nutshell, I think there is what I would call a soft form of multiculturalism, which is the, we see all around us here in Sydney, where we live at any rate, we see the easygoing, exchange and interaction between people of very different backgrounds who are just living their lives and enjoying everything that this country has to offer. There is the harder multiculturalism by contrast, which is characterized by the an emphasis on what I might call tribal identity. And it's driven by identity politics. So it's an emphasis on the group, a group asserts rights against other groups. And that, that form of hard multiculturalism, which I have written a lot about, uh, is something that I think um, can lead to fragmentation. So multiculturalism in its hard, aggressive form, I think, is something we need to guard against. Multiculturalism in its soft, um, everyday 
Australian way of life form is something that we need to uphold and preserve. And long may we do so. And I'm delighted that the, C- that the CIS uh, over a number of years now has been a, a significant contributor to that, to that debate. Can I ask you a question about the migrant experience? Uh, your, your migrant, you've, you were born and bred and studied and worked in the, in the United Kingdom. And now Australia is your home. Do you want to make a comment on what it's like to come to this country a bit from England is not, not a ma- massive cultural gap, but it is a cultural jump nonetheless, between the migrant experience and how you appreciate the diversity of this country. It's an interesting question. I, I think it was actually a much bigger cultural jump than, than you might imagine, although I- I England might think, or Britain might think of itself as, as the mother country to Australia. Australia is a very different country with some identifiable... Um, identifiable inherited threads, and of course there are there are legal and emotional and constitutional links to to Britain. But it's a but Australia is a very different country. It, what I think it showed me, what it, what is the way in which it's informed my life and work in the last twenty six years since I've been here, is that I it, it's made me very passionate about about defending what is good about Australia and, and emphasising the good rather than deploring the country uh, and, 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 and moaning what's befallen it, as some tend to. I see Australia as being a real force for good in the world and, uh, and is a country that has much to be proud of and stands for very important principles. And I think as a migrant, one comes and sees with fresh eyes in, in a way that one doesn't, I think, if you grow up and if you're born and grow up in a country. I, I think very differently about Australia, for example, than I would if I stayed in the UK where I'd grown up and in England where I'd grown up and I knew sort of draw, taken everything that England offered um, and stood for in, as it were, with my mother's milk. In As a migrant, one has to learn new social forms, new linguistic forms, new m- mannerisms, new forms of etiquette. And I think it, the, the learning, the, the, the exercise of learning those new forms of life is actually very stimulating. It gives me great hope. I and mean, that's one of the reasons I am always optimistic about Australia, even when we can think um, things are going to hell in a handcart. I'm optimistic about Australia because I think it's a country with enormous potential and uh, 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 tremendous freedom in, uh, to th- that's afforded all its citizens to enjoy everything that the country has to offer to the full. So I'm, I see my life, my work at CIS as being about pointing to the positive side of Australia, wanting to warn where necessary, to urge correction where necessary, but to uh, but to to affirm and encourage, because I'm I'm fundamentally optimistic about the country. Well, here's the last question, and it's going to test your your mettle, I think. In the Ashes series of cricket, do you support which country? Do you support? I wish you hadn't asked me about sport. Uh, sport plays almost no part. I see. In my life, I I have no emotional allegiance to any team, any any national team or any any local team. It just doesn't feature. In that respect, I am very deficient as an Australian. Mm, I've been yes, a, an Australian are, citizen for yes. over twenty years, uh, and I am I am I am very sadly deficient. I think we should get to the part of homeland security onto you. I think there's plainly weaknesses here. So I'm sorry not to be able to answer that question. Yes, I can see. I, I can see why not. Yes, I can see why not. Thank you, Peter. Uh, my guest today has been uh, Peter Curty from the a man with many strengths, but apparently at the end a significant weakness we've just discovered. <laughs> This has been another podcast of Liberalism in Question from the Centre for Independent Studies. For decades, the CIS has been the independent voice working to deliver evidence-based policy within a classical liberal framework. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our cause. Check out the links on the website to see how you can get involved. I'm Rob Forsyth. Thank you for listening.